No. Sorry about that. <laughs> you have to start over. No. Okay. All right. So this is how to, this is the most important part of the presentation, okay? So good that that is muted now. <laughs> how does a photovoltaic device work? So the first thing is that the electron, this is an animation, so I don't see the animation anymore because we're here. The electron steals this photon coming in, he likes the photon, he absorbs it. It's going to jump from this energy level in the valence band to the bottom of uh, this energy level in the conduction band. So when he jumps from here to here, he leaves this H, the hole behind. So having an electron here is normal. When the photon comes in, it jumps and it goes over here, up here. And once you're, once you're up here, you're leaving behind a hole. Think of the hole as a bubble of missing electrons. Like when you have sodas and bubbles are coming up, that's the hole. It's better to describe the bubble moving up than talking about how the, your Coke is moving around to fill in the void that was left behind and more Coke and moving around on the way. So that's what this hole is. So now that we have the electron up here and the hole right here, if you have an electric field, the electron likes to move in some direction and the hole moves in the other direction. So once you form the electron up here and a hole behind, that's called the exciton. And then when you have an electric field, that electric field makes it so that the exciton moves. That's the migration of the exciton. And if you have that, this is some process that creates current as the electrons flow in one direction and the holes flow in the other direction. So that's how they would look later, but we're missing the animation. All right, so let's look at silicon back at silicon. Silicon is, this is the official way you would look. This is a cartoon version of it. So what we have is that there's a gap right here in gray. But then we see that for silicon, as a function of energy, if you want to jump from here to here, it takes you 3.4 electron volts. So that's a huge jump. But if you could jump from here to here, it's just 1.1 electron volts. So, photons don't have mass, right? Photons is a light particle. They don't have mass. So, what they do is that they cannot give you a kick in momentum. So, if you want to get a kick from momentum, you have to have the ions in the lattice, the ions in the cell, be moving around. And then when those guys are there, those guys give you momentum. So, what you have to do then is that an electron gets kicked and absorbs a 1.1 electron volt photon or bigger energies, and then you can jump to this space. So this case in momentum is due to the phonons, due to the thermal vibrations of the ions. The other thing then is that this material, if it, if it wasn't for the phonons, the thermal vibrations, it would have to jump 3.4 electron volts. So that's a very huge jump in energy. So it's like thinking in, in terms of the solar spectrum, this is normal light spectrum that we like. This is more into the UV. And then you don't get absorbed on this. You have this much energy. It wasn't for this position right there. So there are other materials. Here I have a cartoon of how it looks for gallium arsenide. So in gallium arsenide, the bottom of the blue one and the top of the pink one, they're together on the same momentum line at zero momentum. So that means that that's a direct gap material as opposed to this one. So for gallium arsenide, you wouldn't need to have the thermal vibrations to promote you and start doing the electronic process for photovoltaics. So what this means is that here's a challenge that we see in photovoltaic cells. You have to have a minimum photon energy. So for instance, this distance from here, 1.1 distance that has to be jump across this gap that you have, any photon that comes in with less than 1.1 electron volts doesn't get absorbed. So this is the famous photoelectric effect explained by Einstein in 1905. That's what he got the Nobel Prize for, right? The photoelectric effect. And it's the same uh, here. If you don't have 3.4 electron volts, you wouldn't be able to be absorbed from here to here. So the best thing is that you need a minimum photon energy to be in the right place. 1.1 is the right place for us to absorb sunlight. It absorbs most of the sunlight. 
then you have to absorb this light. And then if it's bigger than that, you're losing the energy in between. And that's just lost because the electrons come up. They're up here, they have a lot of energy. They like it up here, but then uh, they start moving in this direction. And all they're doing is that they're giving up energy, not to the circuit that you're making, but rather they're just making your things around them hot because they're making phonons of that energy. So they're making everything get hotter. So that's energy that gets wasted. So anything that gets higher is from 1.1. And then the other thing is that you have to drive the circuit because we have a certain uh, this in the rectangle gap. What you have to do with silicon is that you cannot make it a very thin material. So for instance, if it's less than a micron, it's not going to absorb until you get electron uh, photons that are 3.5 energy. If you make it a millimeter, then it's absorbing the 1.1. So you cannot make it really thin. You have to put a one millimeter coating of silicon in your silicon photovoltaic cells. So that makes them expensive too. And then you have to drive the circuit. So this is from when I teach uh, physics for engineers, semiconductor physics for engineers. We have a pin junction then. And in this area where the P and the N, this is mostly electron bridge. This is mostly hole bridge. We have this area right here. This is the area that accepts and attracts the photons into it and gets them absorbed. So we have to drive the circuit. So you have to make your silicon heat off on one end, end off on the other end, so that you have the area that is appropriate to absorb the material. So that's a challenge for silicon cells. Thinking about silicon versus other materials, Silicon is indirect material, indirect banga, so that makes it that it's not better, it's a little bit worse than other things. The more perfect the silicon crystal, the more efficient. So when you're getting your solar panels, right, those are expensive because they're like 99.99999 perfect. The little solar panels that is in your dollar calculators, those are not that good. So their efficiency is very low, but you don't need a lot of efficiency to drive the power. And then uh, other things that happen, silicon degrades. And that happens when you are at the ultraviolet, exposed to ultraviolet light, which happens to be in the sun, and when the temperature changes too drastically. So those reduce efficiency. Yeah? So it's going under a thermal tech link for a very long time? Exactly. Because about, this. Or shit. Degrade it. No, you just clean it off with the hose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, unless it's really hot. <laughs> so, other materials. We can have multi junction cells. So, I told you that 1.1 electron volts is the energy of the photons coming in. So, if you have a photon coming in with three electron volts, you're losing 1.9 electron volts just to heat. So, we can stack materials so that one absorbs the energetic ones, the other ones pass by, and then the second layer absorbs the other ones, and so forth. That makes for multi-junction cells. If you could deposit a lot less material, I told you, you have to deposit one micron of material, no, sorry, one millimeter of material. That makes it expensive, right? Because you have to make this super pure silicon, and it's pure, and it has a thickness of one millimeter for you to have a good solar cell. So if you can deposit 10 films, that makes it cheaper. And the other thing is that the cost of making silicon solar cells is very expensive because it takes a lot of energy to make the crystal so pure and create that crystal. So imagine that you could just drop a solution on a substrate. You make something like coffee, right? And then you drop it in your table and it leaves a stain. Imagine if making your photovoltaic cells was just as easy as that. You have a substrate and then you just put some drops on it and then the material just dries out there, and then all of a sudden you have a photovoltaic cell. So that's the dropping a solution on a substrate way of doing photovoltaic cells. You cannot do that with silicon. So this is where this material is called, uh, I think I need to move this out of the way. This right here is perovskite. So perovskite is a crystal structure. This one is calcium titanate. It's just rocks that minerals that take this shape. And if you look in the inside of the earth, 
especially around the upper mantle and lower mantle. This is the structure of the perovskite where you have silicon oxide and magnesium inside of them, taking this color things, uh, this portion right here is a bunch of atoms connected, right? And if you look at that, that's the majority of the lower mantle and upper mantle inside the earth. So perovskites are really abundant in our earth. And I have another picture right here. This is what it looks like. Let me move it this way. So inside of here, this is the, the structure. If it's calcium, titanium, and oxide, it would be the ABX structure. You see it here. It was first discovered in 1839 by some guy that lived there after Perovsky because Perovsky was a very famous Russian mineralogist and he wanted to get money from him. So if you want to get money for your grants, you have to name it after your reviewers. <laughs> And any material that has this stoichiometry is going to have some perovskite structure. So silicate, which is the magnesium silicon oxide, is about 75% of the material inside of the Earth's mantle. And this is what those guys are. Either the magnesium or iron and the silicon oxide in this kind of stuff. Inside of the Earth, it goes to 120 gigapascals of pressure and 2,500 Kelvin temperature. And because of that pressure, it just gets deformed a little bit. So it's now called a pseudoperoskite. And it can explain the properties of the mantle of the Earth. So this was recently discovered, as you can see here, 2004. So I say recently, but it's probably when you guys were born, right? Is that uh, the stuff that you use for uh, the caps? Perovskites? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or did you put uh, I don't know. the caps uh, P on there? No, I don't. I think so. You think so? Yeah. The clays? Yeah, maybe. But it's a very good Yep, high porosity. Exactly. You know yeah. um, so you have to have this stoichiometry, ABX treatment. Then you form something that looks like that. All of these materials could be the A on purple, or the orange could be the B, or the X could be this guys over here, but you also can have that some other materials could be put into there. So if you look at the periodic table, you can make perovskites with almost everything. Now, another thing that is cool is that you can have a perovskite that is not, it has a big cation, it's a cesium, that's the A. But you can also make one where instead of a cesium, you have a tiny molecule like this one. So this one is from a medium, it looks, like this, where you have a carbon, a nitrogen, and then three hydrogens on this side, three hydrogens on that side. You can make another one that's called metal ammonium. No, sorry, this is metal ammonium, because it has the met metal and the ammonium right here. So this is ammonia. This is the metal, like methane guys, joined together. Metal ammonium is just one molecule. It's tiny. As long as it fits in there, you could make a system like this. So it turns out that somebody decided to make a perovskite solar cell just for kicks. They measure its efficiency. And I think that this is where, let me see if I can, because I need the other data. This is going to look weird. Oh, there we go. So... Uh, this guy in 2009 decided to take his perovskite that he was making in the lab and make it into a solar cell. It comes out to be a 4% efficient cell. And this is the best journal in chemistry to publish in. And this was very surprising because nobody knew that these things would be good, per, uh, perovskite would be good solar cell panels. So he made it, he publishes, and then uh, that was 2009, 2021. We're now at 25% efficiency for a single junction cell. And for a tandem cell that is a perovskite and a silicon joined together, we're at 29% efficiency. So this thing right here is in Germany, and these are solar panels made out of perovskite. So they look like lines because they're super thin. They just need a little bit of material to absorb the light, and they're really good solar panels, except that they have some deficiencies. Let me not talk about those like people usually do. 
This is the efficiency of solar cells. As you can see, starting in 1975, there were a bunch of different solar cells. And then uh, around 2000, they came up with new materials and a lot more materials are being stored for solar cells. One of those materials is the perovskite. Let's see, right here. These guys over here are the perovskites. And you can see that jump 2009, they're around here. And they're not shown here because the National Renewable Energy Lab didn't characterize them to give them the official ranking. So when you make a really good solar cell, you send it to NREL, and then you tell them, like, can you measure my solar cell, the National Renewable Energy Lab? You tell them, can you measure my solar cell? They'll do it and give it an official ranking on this list. And if you break the record, they put you here. So you can see here 29.8 for this type of perovskite. It's over here, perovskite on silicon as a tandem. And if you just look at perovskite, it's just this orange circle filled with yellow. And you can see how big this jump are. 25.7 efficiency right now. And these are organic materials that were really famous for a while. In fact, the last time I was here, I was talking about organic materials. So now this is way better. And one question is, why is it that they're so efficient? So there's a paper that says that if you, if you passivate the defects, the defects are not gonna do bad things to it, they become better. So this is one of the papers that found out over 20% efficiency. Your regular expensive silicon solar cells are going to be at this level, 24%, 25%. And then another paper said, if you change the material, so this is how you make a solar cell. It has all of this layer. It has glass, the IPO, this BNPD, which is this long molecule right here, goes in between the IPO and your perovskite. Then uh, buckyballs, carbon-60. Then you have other materials, and then here they put another perovskite, again, another layer of buckyballs, and then a copper uh, electron on the top. So this would be the architecture for the solar cell. And people are finding that it's not just this perovskite that is important, the materials that you put in as a solar absorber, but it's also important to know what to put here, like this material that is a buffer between the perovskite and the IPO, which is this organic material here. People use, it, use something that is called PPA. If you use this other one, it's going to get way better. So one of the questions was why, and it's because you have more efficient materials that work better. So, another thing, I told you that they made perovskites, but I didn't tell you that the most efficient ones are made with lead. So you don't want lead, right? You guys all know about the issues that happened, like Flint, because they had lead in their pipes, right? Lead in the paint. So you don't want lead. So it's an environmental and health threat. So why don't you make a material without lead? So this is something that we were wondering, and we have been thinking like perovskites over silicon or other devices. This is what people were really interested at, uh, not really interested right now. They make a silicon photocell, and then on top of that, they put a perovskite so that it can absorb the higher energy. <laughs> Photons first. And we were thinking, like, okay, let's try to figure out how to do one without lead. And this is what happened. I started reading about what people were doing. They started at 626 when they were making the tandem cells, one cell on top of the other, sorry, material on top of the other of two perovskites. Initially, they were at 6% efficiency. Then, when we were writing the paper, it was 24%. Then the next year, it jumped to 24.2. And then I we finish the paper, we submit it, and then the reviewer is like, oh, that's not the highest efficiency one. You should look at this paper. So we have to address that at 24.9. So that's how fast the world is moving right now. Everybody's doing these materials. And we said, according to our theory in this paper, you can make a perovskite standard solar cell without lead for 30.85 efficiency. So now we're looking for people to make it. Let me tell you, yeah. So what's the prospect of doing lead-free um, if the bed is very toxic? So you want to make it lead-free because of the toxicity. That's one aspect. People don't want to deal with making lead 
solutions and then those escaping out into anywhere. Um, that's the main reason to not one let. But, but that's the only thing that stops uh, kryptonite radiation. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Superman who's messing with us, right? But no, uh, that's one of the main reasons. You don't want to have lead because then have, when you dispose of those solar cells, it's going to be really expensive to dispose of them. You don't want something that is an environmental hazard. Yeah? This chart you showed so some other, um, I think it's just going quite a bit higher. So, yeah. so what, what is the advantage of perovskite? All right. If, if the, if the solar excellent question. Around 40, yeah, excellent question. So let's look at this one. This blue line right here, right? It has the blue circles. If I go here, this is a silicon heterostructure. So this blue one is the best silicon cell. And this is a heterostructure, so it has to be grown with another material. Heterostructure means that you make two materials together, one on top of the other, maybe. And for that, it's really expensive to make. So this is not the commercial solar cells made out of silicon that you will get. These are what NASA buys, what the Air Force buys. So when the Air Force buys cells for their predator thing that is flying all day, they buy this one, because those are million dollars. So this is super expensive. That's the best silicon thing you can make. If you look at the other ones, all of these ones in purple are multi-junction cells. And some of them with value marginalized are tier two in purple. And you can see that the most efficient one is 47.1. So that's because you make this sandwich with three different materials. That's to capture different frequencies. Of exactly. So you capture the most energetic one, lets the other one pass, and this one catches the more the less medium energetic one. Yeah. And then the third one catches all of the lower ones. And you don't lose that energy that the highest ones were. The, 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 all the other ones, this one can capture the high energy ones. But then it just wastes energy because it only gives you 1.1 electron volts out of it. And the rest just goes into heating your solar cell. So those are really expensive. What we're saying is that this one's right here would be way cheaper to make. Like I said, you just put it in a, you make them in a beaker, like a, and then you just deposit it by putting drops on the system. Is it because that perovskite is more uh, common compared? It's cheaper, yeah. It's cheaper to make because you have all of these materials around you. I mean, silicon is really common too, right? But then you have to purify it. But perovskites are really easy to make because you don't have to go to super high temperatures. You can just get them and put them in a beaker, like a chemistry reaction, very simple one. You put them with solvents in, and then uh, heat it up to the right temperature, and now you have perovskite solution. Almost like making coffee. Anybody here has uh, touched silicon with his hair hands? No? Well, when we're done, come here and touch Glass. With very little purity, right? Because that's not, it's letting all of the photons in. That's why we make it like that, the glass. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a part of the, the like they want aesthetic as well? Like they want it to be like see-through to like make it look good? But like, that would be perfect, right? Like, let me show you a picture of it before. So, so since you can make them so that they're thin films, you could make them different colors and get really pretty lines. So that's one reason you might want perovskite. But also, uh, you can with the, um, there is a way of making it uh, like a paint, inflexible, right? Yeah, you just have to have a different substrate. It's yeah. Yeah. So these are we can roll it. Like, yeah. So don't you want to have naturally like all the other all the No, not yet. Not no, not yet. They do have things that roll out that are really cool but it's not for Oscars yet. But we're trying to figure out which one it is that they should use. So let me go back over here. So this is the calculations that we're doing. Again, I'm a theorist, right? So I do calculations. We put this system that has the titanium oxide lights coming in. This is the metal ammonium germanium iodine. This is a perovskite. Then we make the other parts that are needed for the device. This one absorbs some of the light, and this spectra gets filtered. The light coming in is a different color than the one coming in from the sun. 
And then we have another perovskite down there with the layers that you need when you're making the solar cell. So we were starting to simulate these things and we tried, we, I'm just presenting the things that work, right? But we tried a bunch of different combinations. So then what we're looking at is how does this interface look? How does this, how many defects can you put in there and it still work? How much thickness does each material have to be? And all of that is what we do in our simulations. So our simulation then looked at, for instance, uh, here in this plot. All right, so this is going slower. All right, so this is by changing the uh, capture cross-section, optimizing the capture cross-section. And that means that if you have an electron in the hole, that they're captured, right, by the device. And we see that if we have different parameters like the open circuit voltage, that's how much voltage is across the solar cell, how much current is passing by. This filling factor is a quantum mechanical quantity that tells us how many electrons and holes are going to be there. And then we look at the efficiency and we see that if the capture cross section is smaller, then we get the better efficiency because they can move out of the solar cell. The same thing in the other material that is the hole absorber. And by doing plots like this, we have another one. Let's see, this is about the thickness. If the material is less thick, the efficiency is lower, but then it just saturates uh, something like a thousand right here. It's about a thousand nanometers, one micron. It just saturates and it's not gonna get better. So we find how to optimize one of the solar cells these are just numbers, so let me just scroll through them. And then when we optimize the two cells, we also have to make sure they're in a tandem device, so they have to have the same current passing through them. So if you optimize one, it's going to have a higher current than the other one. So then what we want to do is that this is uh, as a function of the capsule cell thickness. When is it that we get the best, the, the two crossing lines there? And they have to have the, the same current passing by. So this is where the orange line crosses, is the best one, with this black line. And, I also, and that makes it so that this is a 30%, a 30.85% efficiency. And even if that thickness cannot be reached, let's say that you could only reach 1,000 nanometers, one micron on the other one, we still see that crossing down here would lead to about a 30% 0.7 device. So we think that those two materials would be really good for making a device out of. When we have all of this data, we went to our experimentalist friends and they're like, you guys are morons. We cannot really work with this one that well. And uh, germanium is one of the things that we could sub in, but nobody's using it because it's really hard to do the chemistry with. So we have to figure out people that are brave that want to try this material. Because my current chemist friends don't want to do it. All right, so let me tell you a little bit more about perovskites. Perovskites are the highest performing thin film right now. So it's really good. Thin films, less material you have to use. They're easy to fabricate. They absorb a lot of the light. They have a long carrier lifetime. That's good. The charges move really well to them. And then this is really important. They have a high tolerance for defects. So like I said, silicon has to be super crystalline. Perovskites are just things that you make like whatever in, the, in a beaker or something else, and they're full of defects. So if you add more defects, if all of a sudden it has more defects, it doesn't matter. It's just already efficient with, with a lot of defects. So adding another defect is not going to destroy it. As opposed to silicon. So now this is one that has an animation. Let me show the animation by going over here. This is the efficiency versus the timeline that it takes, how many hours it takes for it to be reduced to 80% efficiency. So this is the animation that I wanted to show you. This is what we had. So this advantage of perovskite solar cells. It degrades when it's close to light. So that's probably a bad thing to have in a photovoltaic cell, right? If you expose it to moisture, moisture, oxygen, or UV light, it degrades. 
So that's, uh, that's why this is hidden. Uh, in this picture right here, I'm showing you how much efficiency they have at the beginning in this axis, the x-axis. So these are all different perovskites. This is from 2017. So the, the record holder was 20% efficient. And then in this axis on the y is how much time it takes for them to degrade to 80% of their original efficiency. What we see here is that there's materials like crystalline silicon that last for 30 years. So up here is 30,000 hours working. This guy is about 200 hours working, and then it degrades. So that's a big problem, right? So that's the biggest issue right now. That's why we don't have them commercially available yet. You want something that lasts for five years. And if you want to compete with silicon, it has to be cheap enough that it lasts for five years because you don't want to change your panels every five years, less than every five years. And that it's either way cheaper, or if it's going to be expensive, that it lasts for 25 years. Or so. Otherwise, you don't want to use it. I mean, we did, we did a, a study. Uh, one of my students uh, finished her thesis on this, and we tracked iodine and lead, and they degraded. They, right. Somehow they, they lose. So we, we lost part of the iodine in the Kurokex. So. But uh, we also tried to encapsulate. Uh -huh. and that helps. Yep. It gives them uh, away from. Uh, but then again, you lose uh, the light that yeah. uh, you go through the, the light. Yeah, so that's what people do. They make them, and then they make sure that they're not exposed to oxygen or moisture. So that's encapsulating. That's a process, industrial process, that is done on everything, right? Like your panels here, they're encapsulated, all of that. So that's one of the things that could be done that is missing down here. But just by having exposure to those, they degrade super fast. Like they don't last an hour if you just expose them to oxygen. So I'm gonna show you other pictures about this. So this is my theory slide. This is the theory that we use. It's called bank dependent density functional theory. We calculate atomic orbitals with density functional theory. This is quantum mechanics, right? And then we solve the time dependent density, the time dependent density devolution as a function of time of the density by just doing this Hamiltonian right here. So here in the potential is when you can put all of your light, lasers, or magnetic fields, whatever you want to do. So we have the initial conditions set quantum mechanically, and then we just evolve in time to those orbitals of the system. So it can give me the response to laser fields. And I guess everybody's too young to remember this, but I have a chart with a freaking laser mounted on top of it. You guys never saw some powers. I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Evil, that's what he says. He wants to have. Con, con got uh, the Nobel Prize for the equation uh, back in the 60s. He made it in the 60s, but he got the Nobel Prize like around 2000. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, other things that we're doing this is the FA molecule with lead and iodine. It's called PAPI. We have that the best efficiency is about 20%. It has it's more stability than the MAPI one. This is called MAPI, and this one is MAPI. So where you have the metal ammonium. And we were wondering what happens when you exchange lead with something else. So let me just go real quick here. This is another material. Instead of lead, let's use a function. It's very abundant, non-toxic. It's similar to lead, except for the being non-toxic parts. It has the same number of electrons on the outside. So we were thinking this may be a really good material to sub in. So here's what we did. When we do our calculations, this is the original one. It looks like this from the different angles. So it's like a cubic cage that the molecule is inside of. And uh, if we replace one with this green one right here, I don't know if you guys noticed, but they just buckle a little bit. So this is the reason that people said like, oh, if you change led to something else, it might not be a good material for solar cells. So we were saying you guys should try it before you poopy all over it. And here's our calculations for it. This is the puppy by itself. This is if it's low by 50% estrogen. 
So it changes the energy from 1.5 to 1.6, a small change up. So it's not too bad. It's gonna absorb less of the light, but it's still gonna absorb a lot of light. If we look at the density of states, that would tell you like where is it absorbing and how much. We see that around this area and this area, they're about the same. So that would be the, from the conduction band, from the valence band to the conduction band. So things are not gonna change. So according to our calculations, it should be a really good material to use. I don't have time to explain this one. Let me jump to the really exciting stuff. So we got money from NASA uh, three, four years ago. The grant just finished in September. And what we said is perovskites might be really good for photovoltaics in space because they have a lot of defects. So the defects that come from um, solar radiation are not gonna change its behavior much. If you send um, silicon photovoltaic cells out of space, outside of the Van Allen belts, the red solar radiation, the protons coming in, are gonna hit it and make that silicon useless right away. So anything above where satellites are usually in orbit, they get destroyed. And then the main thing is that people were saying like, yeah, but what about the space environment, right? So this is what one of my colleagues at Oklahoma did. Well, this is the solar irradiance as a function of distance from the sun. So if we look at the earth, this is the position of the earth in distance from the sun, one right in, the, in this solar unit. And we get uh, our temperature to be about 300 degrees. If we go to Jupiter, that temperature is closer to 100 degrees. And if we go to Saturn, the temperature is even lower than 100 degrees. So they said, NASA wants to send little tiny satellites, they're called CubeSats, they want to send them to space. And they said, uh, we said, how about if the CubeSats could be sent to Jupiter or Saturn, could have solar cells in them instead of a nuclear pill that generates electricity for them to work. And that was a proposal. The disadvantage here is the temperature, very low temperature. So again, silicon doesn't work at low temperature because you need the extra kick from the thermal things moving that around. And the other thing is how much sun are we getting? So if we go the same way at the Earth, this is how much sun we're getting right here. In Mars, it's way lower. But then if we go to Jupiter or even Saturn, in Saturn, it's 100 times the sun that we get here. That's how much you would, the irradiance, the sun would look 100 times smaller in Saturn than what we see. So the question became, could a solar cell work well in that environment? So my colleague, Ian Seller, we were, were collaborators still, and he was uh, doing these measurements. He found out that in Jupiter conditions, and in Saturn conditions, and in Mars conditions, at the temperature that they would be exposed to, things would work really well for perovskites. Not for silicon, right? But for perovskites. So we do those measurements. Well, they do those measurements where they put the solar cells, they put the temperature right, and then they put a light bulb at that right light conditions and they found out that they work really well. And that was the basis of, of this uh, grant that we got, that we said they should work. Now let us go test the radiation hardness of it. Um, do you guys know what would happen? What are the challenges to sending something to the moon? Cycling. Sorry? The cycling. A stress cycling. Why a stress cycling? Uh, because you have a lot of vibration going through initially. Uh, well, uh, let's say you put them in the moon. Aside from radiation, too. So we have another grant submitted. Now we're saying Artemis mission, we want to put things in the moon, right? The biggest challenge is that in the moon, you have 15 days of sunlight and 15 days of darkness. So what's the temperature in the moon during the Sunday? What was that? 400 Celsius. 400? It's higher than 200. No, no, wait. Yeah, 200 Celsius is right. Like 400 Kelvin or so, right? Or something Kelvin. And on the night? Exactly. So now we have to prove that they can survive 15 days super hot, 15 days way cold. So I don't know if that's what we're trying to get them to give us money. Now, in this case, let's look at radiation. Radiation is mainly for protons. Some electrons are there, too. 
but the protons is the hydrogen without the electron around it. And then the sun, when it burps, it just sends protons our way. Lucky for us, there's a magnetic field around the Earth that it deviates all of those protons away. We only get uh, the auroras when that happens, but it's nothing too bad for us, right? Yet, in space, you're gonna be bombarded by radiation. And these are protons that could be up to 68 MeVs, that's mega electron volts of energy. You guys know what was NASA doing during the Apollo missions if a solar burp was coming at the astronauts when they were on the way to the moon? Right. The protocol was that Buzz Aldrin would get on top of, of Armstrong because Armstrong was the higher officer. So he was his human shield. That was the protocol. That's what NASA did back in the 60s. So the damage is that we're going to have protons create defects on our material. Um, when you're looking at these materials, you have to, this is nuclear physics, I guess. <laughs> so I'll probably get it wrong in front of Jorge. We have the nuclear part, nuclear nuclear interactions are here at some velocity of the projectile. But if the projectile is traveling fast enough, the, the stopping power is not coming from nuclear nuclear interactions, but it's actually happened to be, there's a crossover, but then at high enough speed, it's mostly from the electron cloud outside of the nuclei. So we're sending particles in, we're capturing some of them, seeing how much energy they deposit into your material and saying this might be able to explain how much damage you're gonna get from the systems being irradiated. So what time do I have to finish for it? Uh, you have about like 10 more minutes. All right. So we, what we did is the following. This is the proton energy, how much energy we're sending it with. This is the speed in this atomic units. So usually when you're talking about proton energies, it's PKBs or MEBs, right? You're sending a proton. And then we're seeing that there's different per perospites right here. They can have different crystal structures. They're, they all look the same, but there's a little bit of difference. Like for instance, this is longer in this direction. This is longer in this direction than in this direction, or it could be cubic or such and such. And we're trying that thin lead, chlorine, chlorine bromine, iodine, uh, cesium, MAPI, and FAPI. So all of those guys are tried. Our work was to go through a bunch of them and look at which ones would work better under radiation. So then again, here, there's a peak. That means that if elect, uh, protons are coming with this mass of energy, they're depositing a lot of energy into the system. If they're coming with more speed, they don't have enough time to interact with the system so they don't damage everything as bad. And we did all of this calculation. So this is what we had to do after that. I told my student, go do this, it's easy. Just do all the calculations, right? And then he comes back with a bunch of data. And now we have to figure out what to do with all this data and find trends. And what we found is that the trend is basically, if you look at triangle, 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 they go triangles like this up. Um, the different materials are based on the color and whether they have lead or thin. And what we find is that the trend happens to be with the density of the material. The denser the material, the more stopping power it has. So then we're thinking you have to make lighter, use lighter materials for this. That's gonna reduce how much the, the, the stopping power that material is, is affecting it. So with this, we were able to say using organic and cubic organic materials of the lowest density so that you get the high, uh, so, sorry, I'm saying it wrong. If we use inorganic or cubic organic, at that density, you have high stopping power. But for all the other ones, um, you have better if you reduce the density of the system for the other organic phases. So for some reason, the organic phases are acting differently than the, than the expectations were. Um, then we did another calculation. 
For instance, in this calculation, we have that there's a little problem right here. This problem is going to be sent in this direction. This is the cell that we're using repeated a bunch of times. And then we're looking at, or here, there's a problem coming in just in some random direction. And we're looking at how much energy is being deposited on the system. And this is the, the charge density of the system. The molecule is less dense than the other stuff. It has less electrons. So it doesn't have as much uh, weight in it. And we're able to do these calculations right here and figure out exactly where is it that it has the highest stopping power. We can correlate that with what the sun protons would be doing. And let me just go to this picture right here. Here we have one type of material and one type of atom, another type of atom, and another type of atom. So this is strontium, lead, lead, and iodine in purple. And what we see then is that the next picture right here. This is the force that the projectile is passing by on the strontium on the iodine and on the lead. So we're looking at it, and then we see that this thing starts rattling like a maraca. The proton passed a long time ago, and it just kept rattling like crazy. We don't see that on the lead, but we do see some rattling on the iodine. So just because the proton is passing by, things get vibrating like that. Yeah? And uh, yeah, this is the things. Are this rattling atoms causing the damage? That's the question that we're asking now. And we're trying to solve that. Let's see, I have another one that I wanted to show. All right, so this picture, this is another research project, but this is just to show you how experimentally they made this thing. So they created this system lead iodine. When they made it, it was looking like this. This is inside of an oven, and then they just put the materials in the oven, they bring it up to the right temperature, and it forms crystals. And there's this little black crystals everywhere right here. And they have this cubic structure. This is from X-ray data. So then what they did is that they opened it up and let the air in, and they turned yellow. The yellow crystals are horrible for, for photovoltaics. The black ones are would be excellent for photovoltaics. This is what happens. As soon as it gets exposed to air, this is that they expose it to normal air, and then just cut it through it and took a picture right away. And you can see how it's degrading super fast. So that's how fast it's degrading. In a couple of minutes, it just degraded like that. In 15 minutes, this whole thing turns into this one. And we're also trying to understand that with computer simulations. So let's play this. So our efforts have been on trying to figure out how we change this from silicon to perovskite. When we send things up for radiation, this has worked with the NASA people. They have come back with the materials and are observing it. But what they found is that they didn't degrade in space. In fact, some of them, when they were exposed to the radiation just from being in the space station, they got even a little better. And that was really unexpected. So we don't understand a lot of stuff of what's going on there. So we're trying to use theory. We're using, we have colleagues that do experiments on these things, like for instance, my colleague Ian Seller that I mentioned about who does the optical measurements. Another colleague of mine is working in the University of Oklahoma. So that's the Sooners, the bad guys. They make the crystals, then they get into the cellars, they make devices, measure the device, then they take it to the University of North Texas, that's in Denton, where they have a particle accelerator, they have Van der Graaff accelerator, they send protons, and then they bring them back to Norman, Oklahoma, to OU, to do the measurements. And it turns out that the proton radiation, as it happens, it degrades the material a little bit. But then just on the drive, when you take them off the, the particle accelerator, put them back in their cases, drive for two hours up to Norman at normal temperatures, the things heal by themselves back to normal. 
So we found that that was really cool, that it's really puzzling that things just fix themselves just by being thermally cycled. And the defects just go away. So that's the work that we're doing at Oklahoma. So again, this is my team. So I'll just leave this picture while I answer more questions. This is the NASA grant that we had that just finished. And uh, this is Bumblebee, just outside of Stillwater. You didn't see it, right? Because I don't no. think it was there yet. Yeah. So I invited Jorge like in 2013 or so to visit Stillwater. Yeah. Uh, this guy's from Venezuela, this guy's from Venezuela, so we have a few Hispanics. This guy is from Bangladesh, this guy is from Sri Lanka, American, American, American. And then this is the team the next year, and she was an REU student. I also am the director of the REU, and I had that every student that applied from UTEP was admitted. Being the director, I can automatize this one. <laughs> Now, the only issue is that it was only two students that got to apply from UTEP. So you guys need to apply yeah, a, summer program, right? a summer program for research where we pay, we are, we have a proposal submitted for this. We will pay you between five or six thousand dollars and food is paid, um, your stay is paid and travel is paid. So just apply. Yeah, actually, you have to be a resident. Ten weeks, right? It's ten weeks, but yeah, you have to qualify. That's NSF rules, not my rules. If you were start up to me, I wouldn't check those things. But government. So questions? You well, guys get points, right? Money on first. Or anything else? Uh, please see if you have a scientist. That one went from 200 Kelvin to 280. Yeah, because it's in the solar station, in, not the solar station, the International Space Station. And they put it in a place and they, inside of the station, and then they're just there because they know that it gets radiation over time, and then they send it back to, to Earth to analyze it. Yeah? Why is that? Oh, the CubeSats are supposed to be super cheap. Okay. So for exploration things, like for instance, there's a thing that is going to go to Titan called Dragonfly. They wouldn't use it for that. What they want is that, that we have this payload that is super cheap. We just want to send a bunch of them. And, and those little cell appendages are expensive. are expensive to fly up. Uh, everything that you send up to space has a huge price. So if you had normal solar panels, they have to be thick. So those are really expensive to send them up to space. So if you have a film that is a micron thick in your solar cells and they could be folded because you put them in a plastic substrate, that's way better than if you have to have this solar panels that are rigid. So it depends on weight more than the The weight would be for those small satellites, yeah. Um, yeah? So another thing that NASA is doing right now is that they're interested in just taking the bios, the, the solutions, right? We take up the solutions and then we make the perovskites over there with 3D printers. Yeah? Um, you think it will help All right, so the defects don't help it make better. It's more like the defects are already there because he has so many defects when the protons pass by and mess things up, they're not a big of a problem. Now, these things are soft. This is the other cool things about these materials. They're kind of like soft. They're not like a rigid silicon crystal that is brittle, but they're really, rather squishy. So what happens is that as soon as you heat them up, they go back to having that defect be reduced, the big defects. 
So what they see is that, they, yeah, after the proton passes by, there's a reduction, but then that goes away after you thermally cycle it. So that's the cool thing about that material. It's not that the defect is helping. It's more like, and, and actually, that's some of the data that they show. But what we think is that it just got heated up also because the proton is passing by with a lot of energy, and it actually cures some defects over here as it deposits energy. So that's what we're trying to simulate. Is that a, like, you can't, like, mm -hmm. they glass the gas or, like, Yeah, exactly. So that's what we're thinking is happening when the proton is passing by, it just, it doesn't have enough energy to break the alloy apart. And it's just heating, depositing enough energy to heat it enough so that they rearrange themselves to a better structure. So if there's like internal stresses to keep it together to get it cooled down, or it has to do the thermal cycling? Mm, well, when they make the device, they just layer upon layer upon layer, and then the capping on top and things like that. So I don't know that there's too much stress when it's being made. But there's like stresses. Uh, internally, whenever you right, right, right. When something passes by, yeah, yeah. When you heat an object and uh, retaining the shape back back to normal, at least internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that that's that much of a big deal. It's not going to be like trying to explode in one direction or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, it can go. To, the ones that we're studying don't have a, a phase transition that would make them a different unit cell all of a sudden. So it's not going to be a huge amount of stress and pressure on them. We're going to have to keep the room soon. So <clears throat> let me uh, just tell you that if you can sign this, please come and sign it. And second, you, uh, you read my message. There will be no class uh, next week. You know that, right? Did you read my message? I'm going uh, for this meeting uh, in uh, New Orleans, and then, uh, then I'm going to a second meeting in uh, Austin, Texas. I'm being inducted in the uh, uh, System Academy of Distinguished Teachers. So, and, uh, but I, I, in the message, I explained to you that uh, I left a video lecture for you. We have four or five sections that you're going to have to study. And then, when we come back, so next week, there's no quiz. When we come back, there's going to be a quiz on Tuesday and a quiz on Thursday. I mean, everything is in the email message, so please uh, read it. Okay, guys. Thank you. Bye. Turn on the lights, please. Are you still an RVG? Okay, you uh, we don't have it right now, we have to type for it.